Hello there, my name is John Meyer and I bought a Mac Studio. More specifically, I bought one with the M1 Max chip, 64 gigs of RAM and a two terabyte hard drive. This video is from the perspective of someone who lives in the world of making music and also in the world of video. I'm a music producer and composer, but because of these videos that I've been making for YouTube, I now have a handful of clients that just hire me for video. If you're here for the deep tech tips, I'm not the guy. There are plenty other review sites and I've watched all of them. Max Tech is great. Quinn Nelson, Snazzy Labs. I always watch what he has to say. But if you need the perspective of someone who's doing this on a day in and day out basis, well, maybe you can add my information to all the other information out there to help you make a decision. Before we talk about the Mac Studio, we need to talk about the computer that I was using before the Mac Studio, and that was the Mac Mini M1. Before that was the Mac Mini 2018 Intel. I upgraded to that a year ago, and I made possibly the biggest mistake of my computer buying career. And I knew that there was a significant difference between the Intel and the silicone. And even though all of the software that I use on a day in day out basis is not supported, it'll be supported in a week or two, maybe a month. So I bought the M1, I transitioned over. All of the Mac apps were great, but for someone that lives in Pro Tools and Premiere, it was an absolute nightmare. It was not a week, it was not two weeks, it was months and it was a miserable experience. I would use the betas on Premiere, some would work, others would not work at all. It was the worst computer decision I've ever made. But that brings up a good point. Most people don't talk about this when they talk about buying computers. My computer experience is only as good as the software that I use with that computer and whether or not it is updated and working flawlessly. But that all goes into the decision-making process. Will the software that I use work? And right now, fingers crossed, it all seems to be working well. But even though the Mini M1 is adequate for most of what I do, it is lacking in one big area. The most noticeable area is the way that it handles the large 4K compressed files from my Sony A7S III, which I'm using right now to film me. I mostly record in the XAVCS, I'm having to look at myself here on the screen, XAVCS 4K codec, which is the middle of the line. These files get compressed and the more compressed a file is, the smaller the file size, but the harder it is for the computer to read. On the other hand, you can have these massive, large files that have a higher bit rate, but they work easily on the computer, but they take up a lot of space. So XAVCS is somewhat of an in-between. Different day, as you can see, I'm not wearing my usual black shirt. I'm working on a video for a group called KidLinks that I've worked with for over a decade. They have been doing music for hospitalized children for almost 35 years. And if you look here on the left, you may notice this face. That right there is Noel Paul Stuckey from Peter, Paul and Mary. Pretty big deal. And he was in my studio and we made this video. And you can see on the timeline, I have a handheld camera, which is this one right here. And I have a in place camera, a wide angle lens that I'll jump back and forth eventually. I've got an adjustment layer, which is basically a place where I can add more color effects or anything, but you can see that I'm doing some adjustments to the color. And these are 4K files, not proxy, and I can scrub through these fairly easily. This is from my GH5. To win part. And then from my A7S III. Was well intended. Now, I will say this. One thing I like to do is hit the fast forward button. And especially when I'm editing myself, so I can go through this fast. I mean, do I... Oh, you know, sound effects? But I hit stop already. And then it took a while to stop. And it doesn't always respond. That's with the full resolution files. And that's not great. I was hoping to not have to use proxies. However, when I turn the proxies on, which are, the like I mentioned, they're smaller files that play along with the, the main file and you edit the proxies and then at the end you export the full resolution file. But I can do anything I want with these and jump around. Good. Take some of the things we shared with each other. Fast forward. And releasing a choir. Super fast forward and it's great. And they look good. Again, that's an extra hurdle that I didn't want to jump through. If you know why Premiere is responding this way, if there's something I can do with these files to make them make it so that I can fast forward through the big files, that would be awesome. But this is pretty great, I can't complain. However, I could do something similar on the M1. 
Now, when it's time to export this video, this is about a 40 minute long video. And on the M1, export times varied, but oftentimes it was close to a real time export. If I match the source H.264, and we'll keep it at 1080p with hardware encoding, and let's move this up to 30, which is what I usually do. That's a massive file here. Let's see what kind of estimate we get. Around 14 minutes and I exported this yesterday and that was the time it took. So that's an improvement. Another big surprise is how much of a computer hog graphics can be. Simple titles would bog down my machine and take forever. And it kept me from making titles because I didn't want to deal with it, especially when I was at the end of the video making process. But I've noticed that that is much faster and it renders much faster. So hopefully I will do more with titles now that it doesn't slow me down. One thing to keep in mind when working with both music and video is that each specialty has different needs. Graphics obviously are more important in video. So you need a good graphics card and good graphics performance. The M1 did not have the best graphics performance. And with my Intel Mac mini, which had a terrible graphics card, I actually bought an external GPU, which helped it work a little better, but still wasn't perfect. On the audio side of things, that leans more towards RAM, especially when you're building these massive composer templates. That's not something I do much of, but the more sample instruments and plugins you load into your DAW, well, that requires more RAM. Photo editing also requires more RAM and having quite a few applications open at the same time requires a significant amount of RAM as well. Now let's talk about audio. Hey, I'm editing this video, spinning around in my chair. I did this silly stress test where I put 100 instances of contact with the symphonic strings from Spitfire, and it worked. And then I doubled it, and it didn't work. And it kind of played, but it didn't. I could have showed you that whole process, but I don't know if it taught you anything. We all know that Pro Tools is not the best environment to show off what a computer can do with virtual instruments, so watch somebody else's video for that. A good portion of what I do involves recording music in this room with microphones. And if half my tracks are WAV files, well, any computer can play those back. But would I be upgrading to the Mac Studio if I was only making music? Probably not. The Mini has been great. Let's talk about the ports. This is one of the big upgrades over the M1. The SD card on the front. I know Apple took a lot of grief for taking away the SD cards, so let's applaud them for putting them back. I love having it on the front. And it's also weird that I now have a computer that sits on my desk and I think it's gonna stay on my desk. Computers are supposed to be tucked away and not looked at it. They're loud and noisy, but this one is not. And I think it looks pretty cool. Since mine has the Max chip and not the Ultra, the two ports on the front are USB-C and not Thunderbolt. But there are four Thunderbolt ports in the back, which is huge because the Mac Mini only had two, whereas the Intel Mac Mini from before had four. I don't know. Pretty quickly after buying the M1, I realized I needed a dock or a hub of some kind. So I bought this CalDigit hub. It's the older model. They just came out with a new one, but that had an SD card reader on the front and USB-A connections in the back, multiple Thunderbolt and USB-C connections. So most of that is on the new Mac Studio. I'm still using it plugged into my Mac Studio. Ironically, it gives me more USB-A connections, which I have about 8,000 USB-A connections in the studio, running through hubs all over the place. They're buried just out of frame. And it's also nice having an additional SD card. Like just a moment ago, I did a two camera shoot and I was able to take both of them out and put both SD cards in and transfer and walk away instead of having to do one and then do the next. Another nice addition is the 10 gigabit. Am I saying that right? I hope I'm saying that right, ethernet. Basically it's faster ethernet than what I had on the Mac mini. So for the Mac mini, what I had to do was get an adapter and run it through this other CalDigit device that gave me USB-C to 10 gigabit ethernet that then went through my ceiling into the other room into my NAS, which is the network area storage. And that's where I keep all of my data. For all of my audio files, I work directly off that drive. And for my video files, I used to work off of an SSD drive, an external SSD drive, and then back everything up to the NAS. And the reason why I bought the two terabyte version is I made a volume called Mac Studio Current, and I work off of that drive. I put all of my current video projects and every night they're backed up to my NAS. And then when I no longer need them on the current drive, I delete them, but that way I always have two copies. And so far it's been a pretty good system. Thankfully the Bluetooth seems to be functioning properly. 
with my M1. It did not function properly, had all types of issues, and I know that I wasn't alone. And it may have been resolved, but after a while, I simply used my plugged in keyboard instead of my wireless keyboard. But so far, so good. As for noise, it's quiet. Now, I've heard some people talk about how the fans do kick in and it's louder than the M1. The M1 made no noise at all. The old Mac Mini Intel version made a ton of noise and I really noticed it when I would try to record in this room. But I so far haven't had any issues with fan noise. Perhaps if you really get into heavy processing, it, the fans will kick on. But so far I can sit a few feet away and record and it's not much of an issue. And by the way, noise is in everything, so I'm not one to get too worried about a small amount of fan noise. That's what RX is for. Migration. I know many of you are of the opinion that you always do a fresh install, but I did that going from the Intel to the silicone with the Mac Mini M1, and it was awful. It took forever. We all have so much software and so many plugins. To do that every single time we get a new computer, it just seems crazy. So this time I decided to migrate and the process was fairly smooth, although I made a really stupid move and I suggest that you don't do this. The Mac Studio comes in the mail. I want to use it immediately. So I set it up and I start the migration process and I realized that the Mac Mini is on Big Sur and the Mac Studio came with Monterey. Even though that voice in my head said, John, Monterey is not ready for you. I decided, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to upgrade my Big Sur to Monterey right before I transferred everything over. So I did that, transferred everything over. So what happens when I get the Mac Studio running? None of my software works. So then I had to go through the process of upgrading everything to Monterey and finding out, oh, this doesn't work with Monterey. And then of course I find out that Waves needs another $100 from me so that I can use the plugins that I bought 10 years ago. Basically what that means is that I wasn't able to do a direct comparison between a good working Big Sur version of my Mac Mini and the current Mac Studio, but whatever. But next time I will be sure to downgrade the operating system on the new computer so that it matches up with the old machine. Now to the last topic, did I buy the wrong computer? I don't know. For the first decade of my professional music making career, there was a pretty clear choice, or at least it was easier, on which computers to buy. Now, I never had a PC. Please don't leave comments about PCs. I'm sure they're great. I'm never gonna have one, or at least any time in the near future. But with Macs, it was always fairly clear. There was the G4, I think that was my first, and then the G5, and then the original Mac Pro. And then it seems like things kind of separated to where the Mac Pro trash can came along, but it was kind of expensive and maybe the iMac was the answer for me. So I bought an iMac and then I felt like there was a big gap between these consumer machines when the Mac mini came out and the iMac Pro, which was too expensive for me and the Mac Pro of a couple years ago wasn't even a consideration. Thankfully, it seems like what I have now is better than that machine. I have been mentally prepared for the past few years to pay $2,500 to $3,500 on a powerful machine that can handle video and audio and just get the job done without a ton of workarounds. And then last fall happened. Apple announced the MacBook Pro with the Max chip and everybody flipped out. It sure seems like all the reviews have been positive, even from people who typically don't say very good things about Apple. So it's obvious that this chip is somewhat revolutionary. And I ordered a MacBook Pro, but I ordered it that second batch. And after waiting for two months, I finally canceled my order because it had not arrived and they announced the Mac Studio. And as someone who has worked with a studio computer for 25 years, just sitting on or underneath my desk, the idea of having a MacBook Pro, even though it is portable. Now I've always had a MacBook Pro, but it was never a serious machine for me. The serious working music machine that was connected to all my gear and had an iLock plugged into it was a desktop computer or an iMac. And so the thought of putting everything on a laptop, I've got to get over it. And I think I might get over it pretty soon but it scares me. It scares me to throw my working computer in my backpack and go to a coffee shop. Now, again, I need to get over it because the other day I had this thought, oh, with this Mac Studio, I wanna do this remote recording so I could fly and I could just pack it up into my luggage. 
what a stupid thought. I could just buy a MacBook Pro. Now the MacBook Pro that I was prepared to buy was over $4,000 when all was said and done. And this Mac came just over $3,000. I'll keep my old MacBook Pro around for a while for Photoshop work, emails, and all that when I go away from the studio. But at least for the time being, this is my main machine. I was recently looking on eBay to see the prices that some of my old computers are going for that I still need to sell. And I was surprised, you can still get good value out of those old machines. But who knows, maybe in a few months, I'll make another video about my new MacBook Pro and one of you can buy this from me. I realize that $3,000 is a lot of money. I don't make that decision lightly but I plan on using this two, maybe three, maybe four years. And if you divide that cost into monthly payments, but that's not too bad for someone who uses a computer seven, eight hours a day. And if this computer can speed up my video workflow and export times and allows me to focus on other aspects of my career, well then it's definitely worth it. I hope this provided some insight for you. Uh, we're all different, our needs are all different, and now we have options. We have computers that can meet those specific needs, and hopefully this meets mine. Uh, if it doesn't, I'll try to let you know, but so far the results are good. But don't sleep on the Mac Mini M1. It's been a good machine, and I think it will serve many of you well. If you're still here, and this is your first video of mine that you've watched, go to johnmeyermusic.com. I have these prototype sounds that I sample, and you can use those sounds in your productions. I have some stuff you can buy. Most of it is free, so be sure to check that out, and I'll talk to you soon.